Welcome to our third annual Hartford Housing, a local outlook. I'm Amy Janigan, Chair of the State of the Municipalities Task Force for the Hartford County Association of Realtors and one of today's moderators. And I'm Azalea Johnson Fox, President of Women's Council of Realtors, Hartford County Network, and today's other moderator. The Hartford County Association of Realtors is a not-for-profit professional trade organization with 1,500 members who are committed to serving the best interests of their clients and making Hartford County a great place to live. The Hartford County Association of Realtors is the voice of real estate in Hartford County and an advocate for home ownership and property rights. I've heard it said that you can't buy happiness, but you can buy real estate. And that's kind of the same thing, but the housing supply is way down. I'm sure our audience is very interested in hearing what our guests are doing to address market issues and what they have to say about real estate related matters in general. Today, we are joined by Harford County Council President Pat Senti, the Mayor of Aberdeen, Patrick McGrady, the Mayor of Bel Air, Kevin Bianca, and the Mayor of Havity Grace, Bill Martin. Each of our guests will be asked questions about housing related issues and will be given several minutes to answer those questions. If you see that paddle go up, <laughs> it means you should be wrapping up your answers. <laughs> should be. <laughs> Thank you all for being here today. We are eager to hear what's going on in each of your municipalities and across Harford County. I understand the County Executive's Office is looking for public input on a bike path from Bel Air to Harford Community College. Our association supports most green projects as the majority of homeowners want to be able to enjoy walkable communities and green spaces. President Vincente, let's begin with you. I have three questions. What role does the County Council play in those types of decisions? Do you want to be all three? Or well, just no, we'll just start one oh. at a time. <laughs> You're going to make it easy. Well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Always look forward to an opportunity to be able to sit and discuss all issues across the county, not just housing issues. Uh, but the Planning and Zoning Department has asked for input uh, for the trails that they're talking about doing. Uh, we obviously don't see any of that in the beginning, but, you know, the council has final approval authority over the county executive's budget and we look at that intently to see where the dollars are being spent so uh, we pay attention to that council members have the opportunity to advocate for uh, projects within their districts uh, i support them as council president wherever i can uh, recently we supported a waiver request from the city of aberdeen uh, to allow them to move forward with some development there to make them more competitive in the housing market along the Route 40 corridor and obviously all across the county. And I think it's been successful. I talked to the mayor just briefly this morning when I saw him, and we talked about the apartments behind uh, the Klein Shopping Center going in. So that gives uh, everyone an opportunity to get their feet in the door if they can. Great. Hold on, hold on. What yes. do you know about that uh, trail, though, from Bel Air to the community college? I haven't heard of this. I have not heard anything about it yet. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it's in planning and zoning. They're doing what the request. I can talk about that. Okay. Oh, we'll well, there, the you <laughs> there you go. It's yeah. coming. It's coming. Yeah. We'll, we'll right. get, we got more for you. Hold the power. Okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So you had two more questions. Hold on, hold on. Yeah. So you sort of answered part of this, but are there any um, green projects in the works for communities such as Joppa and Edgewood? Yes, I do know that at Nuttall Avenue, they're planning a park and trail there. Uh, Parks and Rec is working on that at this time. Uh, we, we're looking at uh, a Joppa Town Activity Center. Uh, there's uh, work in the process for that, but there's some discussions uh, very similar to what the mayor had with the county at the time trying to identify a location. They want it, as the mayor did in Aberdeen, they want it in a walkable community. And right now they're looking at the Plecker property, which is on Route 7 uh, off of Mountain Road, and that's a little far from the community uh, mm -hmm. to consider it being a walking community. So uh, I do know that. I do know that the county continues to work on dredging um, in the uh, Bush River and Gunpowder River uh, to enhance the opportunities there. Uh, we made an investment in Copenhagen, Copenhaver Park and um, um, 
Mariner Point Park. I couldn't remember oh, the other great. one. Yes. Thank you. Yes. And then what green projects have recently been completed? Um, I think that as far as completion, I'm not 100% sure, uh, but I do know there's many in the works. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mayor McGrady, what green projects have recently been completed or, on, or are on the horizon for the city of Aberdeen? So come back. So we're talking green projects. Green projects. Okay. So uh, I don't like to classify projects as green or otherwise, right? So we've got some community parks uh, projects happening. We've got some playgrounds. And then there's other residential development that's happening that has open space components of those. So uh, Council, Council President Vincenti referred to uh, some development that's happening near the Aberdeen Shopping Center. Uh, what is that called? Beards Hill Plaza, I guess is mm -hmm. what it's called. Um, the Klein Salvo Partnership, they're building 218 residential market rate apartments right there. If you drive back on Beards Hill Road, uh, you'll see they're vertical and they're putting those in. Everything takes forever. And so in 18 or so months, those units will be able to be occupied which will support the densification that we're doing in Aberdeen. We're trying to take advantage of our infrastructure where it exists, mm -hmm. that is the water and the sewer uh, infrastructure, the road infrastructure, rather than building new roads. The, the buzzword in the government speak is uh, impervious surfaces. So rather than creating new ones, we're saying, how can we take advantage of what we've already got in place, uh, the stuff that we've already spent the money to put the pipes in the ground, uh, how can we do that? And so supporting that effort uh, encourages uh, higher density multifamily three four five six unit dwellings rather than single families in some of our uh, older areas of Aberdeen that are not uh, we'll say constrained by homeowners associations where these uh, zonings can happen uh, in Aberdeen's downtown historic downtown uh, we've done a lot of work on promoting what we call the Main Street program uh, which We've got some really interesting incentives in place to encourage redevelopment in this area. So Edmund Street, Roger Street, Law Street, near Route 40 and West Bel Air Avenue, um, where we have waived water sewer connection credits to the tune of something like 18,000 bucks a door uh, for multifamily. That has stimulated at least uh, 50 residential apartments to be constructed in this area. So there's different mechanisms by which multifamily gets built. There's big Wall Street sized in, in uh, multifamily where somebody comes in and builds 250 <coughs> apartments. Um, they go and they get Wall Street funding at three and a half percent interest with a fixed rate note and for 30 years and then they can bankroll the $280 million construction project or whatever it is. And then we've got small mom and pop projects where they are not as overwhelming. Uh, and in our traditional downtown where we've got, you know, 3,200 square foot houses that were built at the turn of the century, you can build a five unit apartment building that looks like those houses. And so that's the direction we're going to maintain the quality of life uh, while having a, so I've been real nerding out recently on, on recently. yeah, recently, <laughs> continuing to nerd out recently on, uh, on community development as it relates to walkability and uh, street design. So from the middle of the street to the edge of the street to the sidewalk to the landscaping to the building, you don't think about it when you're in a place, but some places feel nicer. Some places feel better, and it's hard to put your finger on it, but it's a combination of all these things. So we're working on modifying our codes in Aberdeen to make that um, a more lovely place to be. Um, and I think that it'll be, it'll be good for the county to look at as we're successful or not in these areas to, to look at the county's code as we're doing new development. But I've talked a lot about that. We're doing um, recreation, the activity center. Mm -hmm. the, our whole thing is connectivity. We want our folks who live on either side of the city of Aberdeen to easily be able to get to the other side of the city of Aberdeen. Well, we recently implemented a one-year pilot program with bird scooters, which are these electric scooters that you can... Um, you effectively rent it, right? You take a picture of it with your smartphone, and then you, for $1 and then 42 cents a minute, you can scoot all over the city of Aberdeen, and then they're dockless, so it doesn't have to be parked in a dock. Uh, you ride it until you're done riding it, and then you leave it, and then there's a guy that comes around and scoops them all up and takes them back to, I don't know where he takes them. He, they magically get recharged, right? And then they come, and then he recirculates them through the city so people can take them as a, as a median way of transportation to, to make it closer. So you'd walk, you know, half a mile. But if you want to get from one side of Aberdeen to the other, talking three and a half miles, you can zip there on a scooter faster. So we're looking at these things, not nearly as cool as the tide coming in and out in Haverty Grace, uh, but it's a, you know, it's a, I don't know what they call it, the different form of uh, transportation, smaller than a car, uh, in between walking and biking. Anyway, 
Good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Bianca, what green projects have recently been completed or are on the horizon for the town of Bel Air? Well, that's a tough act to follow, isn't it? I'll tell you, man. <laughs> my life hard. Well, I do want to touch on one thing. Uh, Mayor McGrady talked about the bird scooters. Uh, we're going to see how that goes in Aberdeen yeah. and see if we're going to roll that out in Bel Air, too. Um, it is about connectivity and, and how can we get around town. I think our main worry was we got a brewery on each side of town, and we just pictured the scooters going back and forth all night <laughs> at breweries. But uh, not that that's a bad thing. But um, it is about connectivity, and, and you talked about the HCC Bel Air bike path. Now, that's been on the works for many years with the theory that there is no real student housing for HCC. Um, and there's been discussions since well before my time about how can the town of Bel Air work with HCC to develop some sort of apartments, housing for students in the town, with the goal being then they can then ride the bikes, you know, go back and forth to school. So I believe it is online on Hartford County's website, their draft plan. So I think they're still looking for comments. So please, if you have thoughts about that, weigh in. Um, the town of Bel Air does try and be a very green city. We are a tree city USA. We're proud of that. We plant a lot of trees, maintain our tree canopy. And to Mayor McGrady's point, I, I think that's one of the things that makes a town feel great. I know when we were moving into Bel Air, we looked at our house, we walked around, we said, like, wow, this is beautiful. Look at these big old trees, the sidewalks, the shade in the summer. And I think it's those intangible things that really make a community livable and walkable um, and people want to move there and, and spend their lives there. We also uh, implemented our share of the road project where if you drive around town, you'll see little bike markings on the roads. It's supposed to be a bike route. Um, it does connect to the Mon Pa Trail, which then goes throughout the rest of the county. We're very excited the Mon Pa Trail is going to be fully connected. I think that will be a great thing for the town of Bel Air, great thing for Independent Brewery right there, um, people coming <laughs> and going. Um, we also just recently declared our first Native Plant Week back in May, where we work with uh, a guy named Doug Tallamy, who's a doctor from University of Delaware. He is well known for speaking about native plants. Um, he came and gave a big talk. We sold out the armory for the first time and that I can remember. Had almost 300 people there talking about the importance of native plants, what we can do. We reworked our code to plant more native plants. We don't, you know, plant the foreign real pretty ones. We do plant uh, native plants now. But we really tried to be a green city. And I think it all does go back to connectivity. How can people live in downtown, work in downtown, get around downtown? without having all that need for infrastructure and cars and more roads. Mayor, how far is it from the town of Bel Air to Hartford Community College such that a trail would span that? I want to say about five miles, wow. maybe four miles. It's a long trail. It's a long trail. Well, people are in better shape than me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to run, but you know. That's cool. Thank it you. is a good thing, yes. I think it will be a good thing. Thank you very much. And Mayor Martin, now to you. What green projects have recently been completed or are on the horizon for the city of Howard Grace? Thank, thank you, Amy, and uh, again, thank you everybody for, uh, for having me here. Uh, so green projects in Haver de Grace. Uh, Haver de Grace has an awesome responsibility because of our proximity to the Susquehanna River and Chesapeake Bay. When I took office in 2015, one of our bedrock principles in my administration that as we move forward, and, and we, we, we are moving forward, that we do it in a very responsible way as stewards of the Chesapeake Bay. One of the first things we did, so I'm going to talk real quick just about what we did, what we're doing, what we are going to do that is green because it's, uh, it's some, we're doing some pretty cool stuff. So one of the first things we did in the city of Havre de Grace in 2016 was we entered a contract with Constellation en Energy for 18 acres of solar panel fields near Perriman. Um, they're building them anyway, but they reached out to us and asked us if we would enter into a, an agreement with them. It cost zero money to the taxpayer. We just had to sign a 20-year lease. Now, we went from $0.12 cents a kilowatt hour coal to $0.6.5 cents solar. So we cut our electric budget in half. But what that means is um, all city buildings, police station, water plant, wastewater treatment plant, opera house, city hall, a lot of our street lights are all run by solar power right now as we speak. When the sun shines, it's a good day in Hammer degrees. Um, <laughs> so we also continued, uh, so that saved money for our citizens because sometimes, you know, going green doesn't always save money. You know, that's, that's, that was always the crux. Mm -hmm. It's nice to go green. It feels good. But... But uh, you know, I always say to my, I always say to my friends, uh, you know, I'm not going to name a grocery store, but one time a grocery store came out uh, with uh, plastic bags that were 25% less plastic. Well, what happened was this bag was so thin, they had to double bag everything. So you put 50% <laughs> more back in the landfill. So, I mean, sometimes it's good to go green, but you've got to be smart about it. Um, we started purchasing low-speed electric vehicles for my employees that go from City Hall to the water plant or go from, you know, the police station to the parks. They're all electric. 
uh, low speed, 25 miles an hour. The whole speed limit in Howard Grace is 25 miles an hour. So that costs zero gas, zero maintenance. Uh, we uh, are currently uh, working on, well, probably the best example I can give you, I know everyone here is probably familiar with the promenade in Howard Grace. And, and you know that little, that little corner of Concord Street where the Maritime Museum is and the lighthouse, there's a ravine um, there that was uh, about three, four years ago that was intentionally dug out. And there's a beach now on the promenade. Well, that beach wasn't put there because we wanted a beach. And, and I'm sure that's a question later, but yeah. uh, <laughs> I saw that. Is there beaches in Howard? Yeah. That. Re that beach was put there to treat stormwater runoff for decades. All, I mean, all that water that washed down from downtown Haverty Grace came to that one section and just went out a, through a broken, busted up cement pipe right to the bay. Unfiltered. Unfiltered. Cigarette butts, trash, gum wrappers, right to the Chesapeake Bay. <coughs> and that beach embutment in that ravine, you know, the, the boulders, the, the trees, the grass, that's all intentionally put there, filters that water as it goes through and then gets behind the beach bulkhead and slowly filters through the sand and the gravel that was intentionally put there. And so by the time that water gets into Chesapeake Bay, it's been naturally filtered and cleaned and thermotreated. A lot of people don't think about this, but when you're rainwater, sometimes at a different temperature of like, you know, fish eggs and, you know, tadpoles and stuff like that. But anyway, to, to match the water temperature up with the water is good for the bay. We got a lot of credits for that when we did that. So the reason I bring up that old project is because the biggest project going on in the city of Havre is right now as we speak is the shoreline restoration project going from uh, near the lock house, uh, the Havre Grace Marina, all the way to where Tidewater Grill is. That is the same project at the Maritime Museum times 10. Now, that's a, almost a $7 million project that the state is fully funding. Hartford County is shipping in a million and a half dollars also um, into this project. So we're very grateful for that. But it's fully funded um, from the state and the county. And what that does is that's going to treat dozens and dozens of acres of, of street runoff behind beaches, do the same filtration process, but all that beach, and they're going to create beaches, get rid of hard shoreline. Hard shoreline is, is, is your bulkheads and your stones and all that stuff that's been there, you know, forever. You get rid of the hard shoreline, you're going to create a series of beaches, crescent shape, because it has something to do with the hydro flow and the erosion. Um, but we want people to walk on the beaches, walk your dog on the beach, launch a kayak. We're going to put uh, really nice modern boat ramps there. We're actually, going, we're actually going to build a parking lot there. I know you're probably thinking, are you supposed to build parking lots near the water? Well, if anybody knows the history of Howard Grace, there were oil tanks there back in the day. And so, you know, the, um, MD actually wants us to cap it with a parking lot so yeah. the rain doesn't go into the ground and push more contaminants in the river. Yeah. So it's going to be great for people to visit our town, our residents, to launch boats, to fish, to kayak, to walk a dog on the beach. And that's going to be all the way down from, from almost a lock house down to um, Tidewater Grill. And with that stormwater project, we will be the first town in the state of Maryland to actually obtain our MS4 requirements. Most towns have to trade off things like capacity for water plants, stuff like that, but we'll actually, we'll actually reach that requirement. The biggest holdup in our project was get the green light from the Army Corps of Engineers because in order to go out and put beaches into the water, we had to, we had to uh, kill a couple acres of SAV, submerged aquatic vegetation, but it'll grow back. And just, you know, working with the Army Corps of Engineers, that's a, that's a big entity. To, but we finally, after a couple of years, got the green light. So it's a huge project. It's going on right now. Come down and visit. What, you know, what's happening next? The big renovation downtown. I'm, I'll get to that in a minute. It'll be another question. But it's a big uh, renovation downtown of all the historic district. And we're going to dig up all the streets, bury the power lines, redo the, the roads. Downtown It's about another $7 million project. And with that, we'll do pervious sidewalks. Uh, we'll get more credits because we're going to redo, you know, 120-year-old storm drains and things like that. But another little feather in our cap, and, and I'll finish up here, but is we just finally got the trolley, um, our city trolley on the road. And it would have been done years ago, but there were two things. One, we, we wanted to be electric trolley no matter what. Nothing's worse than just running a big Chevy 350 gas engine around the town, continually you know, burning up gas. But the state of Maryland had a uh, regulation um, through the DMV regs that you couldn't have a low speed trolley, or you couldn't have a low speed vehicle over a gross, uh, gross vehicle weight rate of 3,000 pounds. So we had the low-speed vehicles for my workforce because they were four-seaters, but to have a 14-seat uh, trolley-looking electric bus wasn't allowed on Maryland roads, and it took us four years working with our Hartford delegation and, and, and uh, to just the, the ranks of, the, of Maryland to get the approval. Uh, you know, and so finally we got the approval, and we got the trolleys on the road. They're all electric, and we encourage people to park anywhere in the city, and it just keeps moving people around 
through the through the areas we can visit. So what's it called? It's, that's the best part. The name of it. It's called the tide. The tide's coming in. The tide's going out. Yep. Uh, Ride the tide is, is is what we say. And, and uh, it's uh, the one thing I didn't. And this is very interesting. Like you know, if you're trying to convince people to buy a house in Havre Grace, like one thing I never thought about was half the passengers are residents. I thought it was just. I thought at first it'd be a great way to move tours tourists around visitors. But half the people that ride the trolley, because you know my trolley drivers keep tabs and they're talking to people, they all live in Havre degrees. Like, well, we just wanted to hop on it and go down to the park. I mean, they're, they're, my own citizens are using it more than I ever anticipated, which, which is actually re really good. So we've got a lot of stuff going on Havre degrees. That's green. Uh, North Park, we're going to invest in the trail system, going up towards the quarry, all that stuff. But uh, I can touch on some of that later. I've talked enough. Okay. Thank so, you. Don't mention green in Havre degrees. You're going you're gonna to get it. <laughs> get a long answer. <laughs> you're going to get it. Thank you, guys. Our next topic is affordable housing. Let's quantify what that is right here and now. Entry level residence between two hundred and two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. If we don't have these places, we can't get the next generations in the door. The question I have for all of you is what are your plans to help entry level homeowners get into the area? Let's start with Mayor Martin this time. Affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Have a grace, uh Another one of our my administration's mantras is we're we're an inclusive city. We want everyone in Havre Grace, um, and that can look like a lot of different things, but it can also look like a socioeconomic spectrum too. We want everyone to enjoy the Havre Grace way of life. Um, we call ourselves we we feel like we are a great sample of America. We are geographically a small city though. Uh, you know we're bordered by I ninety five and and the river and the bay and, and and by Aberdeen to the south. So geographically we don't have a whole lot of area. To expand, and when that happens, and you, and then sometimes you become a victim of your own progress. House prices go up, and you get to squeeze sometimes on what you could consider affordable housing. Um, so we, there are areas in Haverford Grace that are more affordable than others. Uh, but one of the biggest projects we have going on right now, um, currently on Route 40 near, um, well, I'll use the landmark near the old Bill Bateman's uh, Plaza, Harvard County Economic Development offices are there. Uh, we have the Blenheim Run project, which is. Um, uh, apartments, over 300. Uh, they're, they're very nice in design, very nice uh, in its layout, um, and so that'll be close to 300, uh, ha um, 300 apartments. There'll be a, re a retail component to that plaza. Uh, it's a really good reputable company. We've seen our work around the state. Um, company's called Green Tree. Uh, so again, that's the whole part of that is geared towards workforce housing, entry level housing, things like that. But Again, we, uh, we're not trying to price anybody out of Havre de Grace. Uh, for a long time, Havre de Grace is probably the most affordable place to live in Harford County. But uh, we, I know now that the tide's turning, no pun on the trolley, but the tide's turning and uh, the tide is rising. And so, like I say, we, there will be uh, more development. I know that there will be uh, development coming at the interchange. Um, uh, there's, there's property up there, uh, the green on Ella property. That's slated to be perhaps 300 to 360 single family homes. What the price point on starting that is, I don't know. Uh, they haven't broken ground yet. We're still waiting for some final things to come through on that. But again, uh, there is housing. I would probably estimate in the city of Howard Grace, we're good for about another 3,000 permits uh, to, our, to, our, to our wastewater treatment capacity. At that point, um, you know, where you build houses in Howard Grace and uh, wastewater treatment plant upgrades. That would be in question, but but we're talking like way over another decade of con mm -hmm. new construction. So, thank you, Mayor Bianca. The question about affordable housing is now to you. Well, thank you. Um, unlike you know Aberdeen, Have the Grace, Bel Air is a little more unique in that we don't really have anywhere to expand. We are three square miles, and I'll talk about this later on too. But we're kind of hemmed in. There's no real where for us to expand, so we have to look to our current area to see what are we going to do? Are we going to redevelop? Are we going to go up? Um, and that raises a whole host of questions, as you probably heard recently, about what the future of Bel Air looks like. We certainly suffer from a lack of affordable housing in our town. We acknowledge it. We know we need to do something. For our own town workforce, we offer uh, a free tax rebate. If you work for town, you live in town, you get your property taxes taken care of. We only have two employees for our 100 person workforce that can actually afford to live in town, two police officers. Um, nobody from DPW, nobody at the sort of lower end of the wage scale can afford to live in our town, and that's a problem. So, moving forward, we've discussed that there are some opportunities. We certainly have uh, hopefully a big project on the horizon with the redevelopment of the Harford Mall. 
I um, hope none of y'all had Sears gift certificates there because it's uh, <laughs> long gone. But um, we have an opportunity to see what we can do to encourage affordable housing. And that may be as we're going through the comprehensive plan and going through development regulations to look at can we incentivize affordable housing for developers. Right now, if you provide on-site parking, you get a 10% bump in height. We may be looking at doing something like that for affordable housing, where if you can offer affordable housing, um, we will be maybe offer you certain more height or wherever we can find ways. And that's also where we also welcome comments from, from you all experts working in the field. What can we do to encourage that kind of growth? Because we just like Mayor Martin said, we want everybody to live in Bel Air. And over the past few years, I think you've seen Bel Air really change over. I know in my neighborhood, when I moved in, um, my buddies in the neighborhood, I had a 92-year-old, you know, we gripe about the Orioles together, 89-year-old uh, on the other corner. And it was like, man, I, I'm like the youngest dude here by like 60 years. So, yeah, but over the past few years, you've seen it used to be just one kid at the bus stop. Now it's two, four, ten. So we really want to keep that kind of growth coming. We want to make sure the next generation can experience all that Bel Air has to offer as well. So we certainly welcome any ideas that the Association of Realtors has as how we can incentivize that for developers and make sure we are getting all of our uh, affordable housing needs met in the town of Bel Air. Thank you. Mayor team. McGrady, what is Aberdeen doing to address affordable housing? Great. How much time do I have? <laughs> okay. All right. I'm just kidding. All right. All right. Get, get, get the stop right. Okay. Uh, it's always important when we're talking about housing affordability to break down exactly what we mean. Affordable housing and the government definition of affordable housing means government subsidized housing. It means the rent is a number, but the government artificially <coughs> reduces it through some mechanism. Uh, what's the project called? 300 units on Route 40. What's it called? Blenheim? Uh, Blenheim Run. Blenheim Run? Apartments, yeah. uh, is a low income housing tax credit. So LIHTC is a federal government program where tax credits are allocated and then they're required by statute to limit who's allowed to rent there based on the Baltimore median metro rents. Right, so it's an artificial limitation on who's allowed to rent there. If you make more than, let's say, $87,000 in a three-person household, you're not allowed to rent a unit there. Generally, it's a scam. Not, the low-income housing tax credit is targeted to developers. The cost per unit for that project is something like $378,000 per delivered rental unit. $378,000 per delivered rental unit. In the market rent, if you want to support, and okay, so we're coming back to this. The definition, the thing we need to talk about when we're talking about if somebody can afford to live in our county is not, is it affordable, because that's the word that means government subsidized. We need to use a different kind of language to mean what, we're, what we mean, which is, can the average person who works for the Department of Public Works in Bel Air afford to occupy a home in our town, in our county? Uh, something I've seen recently, they call it attainable housing, uh, which is uh, attainable for the median household income or the, the median income of somebody who's in the Baltimore median metro, 1.5 times the whatever. So that, so that it's, I don't know what that number is that we need to say, but we need to define the terms when we're talking about this. So. I can deliver, I can build, so I do this for a living. I do single family, multifamily, residential development. I can build a six unit residential apartment with 850 square foot apartments, six units, and I can deliver that at 125 bucks a square foot, which at 6% interest rates to build it, I can affordably rent that. Uh, I, the developer can afford to rent that unit for $1,200 a month, which is in the ballpark for a brand new unit of what somebody can afford to rent, a two, two owner household can afford to rent. I think we need to encourage that kind of redevelopment more rather than relying on big, big operations who are gonna come and use state tax credits to come and do this stuff. The problem is it's hard for a onesie twosie developer to do a six unit development, a six residential dwelling development uh, anywhere and so what I've been trying to do in Aberdeen is trying to encourage our local business people to become developers. They say, look, let's work together. We've got our transit-oriented development area in the downtown of Aberdeen, we call it uh, the Main Street area. Let's identify the, the properties where it makes sense to do a project like this, and let's start to 
do these kinds of projects. So we've got a 24 unit apartment complex that's gonna be built right across from City Hall, um, a fancy one. This is gonna be fancy. It's not gonna be attainable. Uh, it's gonna have, uh, so, so, so four stories, right, with an elevator, right? adds $500,000 to the cost of the project, which broken down over all the units adds like 60 bucks, $75 a month in rents just for the cost of the elevator, right? And so from the developer's point of view, the goal is to be able to develop a project that makes money. It doesn't get built if it's not profitable. So one way you can do that is through the low income housing tax credit. Uh, another way you can do that is through the Section 8 housing voucher. Another way you can do that is to make the development regulations so that you can build the units that are attainable, right? Which means the density that you need, you can put incentives in for building taller based on on-site parking, these kinds of things you can do. But it's not as simple as we want more housing. So to the point about the number, the, I think the number was $250,000 in that ballpark of a residential housing unit today. today, 18 months ago, two years ago is a different story. Let's go back to that. Let's go back two years. Uh, a a $200,000 housing unit could be bought readily in the town of Haverty Grace near Battery Village. Those houses there were trading in that ballpark. In Aberdeen, on Aberdeen's east side, in Swan Meadows, in North Dean, these are communities where these 750 to 900 square foot residential single family dwellings exist. Starter homes, a home that a person can occupy. Um, it's not gonna be brand new. So a developer in Aberdeen, Steve Horn is building, is, t is buying these houses on Aberdeen's east side in the community subdivision called Darlington Estates. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and he's been buying these and he's been tearing down every stick of wood Every single stick of wood is being replaced with new sticks of wood. Uh, he's increasing the size from 792 square feet, which is 24 and a, uh, and a half by 20, whatever. And he, he tells we, he's been doing, he's got 40 of these done. So he's, he's got down to a science where he's removing every stick of wood and rebuilding brand new houses, sprinkling them, building them as good as any new construction at the size of a house that's a starter home. Developers can't afford to build a starter home in these new developments they're doing in, in, on Route 22 near a Long Drive in Aberdeen. They can't afford to build a 1,250 square foot residential single family dwelling because of the cost of land. So what it falls on is, is people like me who do this kind of work to, to see these opportunities. Anyway, so the point is he's buying these houses. He's acquired a, a portfolio of about 80 of them over the past 10 or 12 years, and he's been uh, he paid between seventy and one hundred and ten thousand dollars for these. Removes every stick of wood, builds a brand new house, and the most recent one he sold uh, before the spike in interest rates was three hundred thirty-five thousand dollars. Which you know, back at four and a half percent interest rates, you could afford a thirteen hundred dollar mortgage. So when we're talking about affordability, it's not so much the dollar price on the house, and you guys know this in the trade, it's not so much the dollar price, it's what your mortgage can afford. At a 7% mortgage rate that we might be looking down the barrel of in the, in the next couple of months with the jack up in July's interest rates, attainability is a lot harder. I hope what that looks like is a reduced purchase price um, and more stuff trading, but I, you know, we, anyway, you don't buy a house, you buy a mortgage rate, you buy, you buy a mortgage payment. and. Uh, and so if we want to make it so people can afford more houses, I, I don't think that building the fancy houses hurts anything. Building the fancy house doesn't hurt. The solution for a, attainable housing is building more housing. The next generation of housing, 25 years from now, the luxury apartments become the baseline apartments. And so if we want our kids and our grandkids to be able to live in our communities, we need more housing, period. And so there is no one size fits all. Uh, but, you know, NIMBYs are my biggest hmm. bugaboo, right? People who say, oh, our communities, I don't hear it in Aberdeen. I've heard it in, in another in a community in, in Hartford County, but we've got too many people here already. Where are these people going to go? Oh, why, why, why do we, no, we want, we love our community. We should have, we should encourage more people to come to our community because it makes our communities more vibrant. And so the only way to get attainable housing is to have more housing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And President Vincenzi, He's what is? Me out. <laughs> Imagine how my wife feels. <laughs> I feel so sorry for her. <laughs> me too. Um, so, what is the county doing to address affordable housing? Well, first of all, I don't think anything's hardly affordable anymore. Mm. I mean, that is a terrible word. Yeah. I like his his attainable. word attainable. I like that. Um, in the past, the county has put its focus on our seniors, our veterans 
trying to keep them in their homes so that they can age in place, if you will. Um, recently, we've had a lot of people come up and ask us to consider tax credits for new home buyers. Um, and obviously with Ms. Harris purchasing her new home this week, or last week, I should say, uh, her new first home, uh, it's really uh, gave us a lot of information that we didn't have at hand, uh, some of the challenges and some of the difficulties out there. Um, so I think the next council has to look at ways to create more tax incentives uh, for first-time buyers. We have our Hometown Heroes program that addresses our, um, our first responders and things like that, but it, it only helps with settlement costs. It doesn't go any further than that. So <clears throat> we need to look at that. Also, the next council will be faced with the master plan and comprehensive rezoning. And I think it's great uh, where we can take time to focus on infill projects and things of that nature where we do have open spaces, uh, either in Howard Grace, Bel Air, or Aberdeen, wherever we can change and get opportunities throughout the county uh, to redevelop and uh, add things. Uh, workforce housing. Uh, we've had a lot of people complain about some of the projects that are ongoing in the county. And it's hard for us to explain to them that the local government really has no say in the issue, that it's coming from the feds to the state and on to the local jurisdictions. And that affordable house or that um, workforce housing is supposed to be done in an area that are walkable communities, public transportation, and we've seen that's not happened in a couple of locations. Yes, we agree people, everybody needs a place to live. Everybody needs a place to call home. And, and we support that, um, but uh, not in the way they did that. Um, we weren't prepared for that, um, even though that property was zoned for those projects. Uh, we didn't have a say uh, with DPW planning and zoning. No one had a say in that. So um, hopefully in the future, we can take a look at the master plan, comp rezoning, and other tax incentives uh, for first-time buyers. Thank you. Yes. The association. Is the, oh. is the group going to get some questions? Be able to ask some questions later. Not until after. Yeah, we're going to get there. Right Thank now. you. Yes. <laughs> the association was extremely pleased when the accessory dwelling units, or ADU mm -hmm. code, was changed by the county to allow the marketing of homes with these amenities. However. Now that there has been time to see how positive the changes have been in the county, we would like to have the language changed so that a homeowner can now use their ADU for anyone and not just family. Mayor McGrady, how does your municipality handle ADUs? Good. So we're talking about ADUs, accessory dwelling units. I want to come back to what I said before because I was not clear. I don't like to use jargon because it cuts people out of the conversation. I said NIMBY, N-I-M-B-Y. What this means is not in my backyard. People who who come to meetings and say we shouldn't do this so with the bird scooters in Aberdeen we had we had a community meeting last week I'm gonna come back to your question sure. uh, <laughs> and we had people come and say we shouldn't do this we had a, we have a one-year pilot agreement that Aberdeen can cancel at any time for the bird scooters right if we say no more bird scooters they go away people said you shouldn't try this because this brings a kind of person to our community that we don't want to have here because we have we have these scooters and people will be scooting all over the place and then once they're scooting all over the place then they come the dirt bikes and then comes criminals <laughs> no joke that happened at a community meeting last Tuesday and I said, okay, I hear you, you know. I like trying things. I like to see what we can break, and then if it breaks, we do something else, right? This is generally the way we should look at things. Because our local governments easily can change our laws, right? It takes six weeks to change the law, effectively. If we could, we could do it faster if we needed to. We should try things and see what works and what doesn't work. On ADUs, accessory dwelling units, what we're talking about is on a residential single family dwelling parcel of land where today you might envision a cute little cottage with shutters and little plants growing in the front yard an accessory dwelling unit permits you to have a second dwelling unit on the same property right people already do it it's it's they just do it illegally right if you have a a, a garage with a with an apartment above it attached you could rent it to your nephew you could rent it to uh, somebody's the college kids across the street whatever you could rent it to them uh, you just don't tell the government that's what that's how it works in reality the law was changed at, uh, in the city of Aberdeen to allow to permit is the legal jargon for this uh, those units to be made legal all right so now you can build you can get a permit that says I'm allowed to have this accessory dwelling unit to the 
residential single family dwelling. Uh, we've seen one or two of these get implemented. I don't know why, uh, but I think I'm gonna have to go into the ADU construction business uh, to encourage people to do them. So again, it comes down to the value for the people. If we want more housing units, we're gonna have to build them. And if there's a residential single family dwelling on a 120 foot lot or 150 foot deep lot, um, our codes permit you to build a second residential dwelling unit without paying an additional water sewer connection charge. So you can build, again, 125 bucks a square foot builds that unit. Say it's 750 square feet, which is a sizable unit to build uh, for one person or for two people. I mean, it'd be tight with three people, but you could build that uh, and an affordably afford to build that for 80,000 bucks. Uh, the rent for that unit in Aberdeen would be something like $1,200, $1,300 a month, inclusive of water bills, and that could go towards paying half the cost of the residential single-family dwelling on the front. You know, somebody could buy the house, and they could use that to supplement their mortgage payment and encourage people to live there. Again, the, the, and speaking to the, uh, preaching to the choir here, but the benefit of the accessory dwelling unit is that it doesn't add any additional cost to your infrastructure in place nobody practical practically would know it's there it increases the amount of people in our community so listen our people are getting older our community is getting older our older community is going to look for alternatives for housing it doesn't mean they're going to move out of the houses that they live in but who needs a 3500 square foot house with one couple like nobody needs all that house and so people are going to be looking for alternatives my understanding is that people are going to be uh, wanting to either downsize into a smaller unit um, and buy something elsewhere that's smaller and on one level so they don't have to traverse the steps. But I think a lot of people are going to want to have their homes retrofitted to be uh, better for them. They've got the money, whatever. They're going to need to widen doorways to 36 inches in case they're going to need to get through with a wheelchair. They're going to need accessibility improvements in their home to eliminate stairs. And I think that's going to be the trend in the near term. And this accessory dwelling unit will allow people to build that small unit that they could live in and then either have their, their, everybody wants to be near their kids. All right, coming back to this. I have a six-year-old, I have an eight-year-old, and I have a three-year-old. What I'm trying to do is make my community a place where when my kids get big, they don't have to move away. This is what we're all trying to do. It's, it's hard to elucidate this, but we want to be where our kids are, big picture, because we love them. And I want to make it so that families can be near their kids so they can have that support system and, and all be in the same community. And so to that end, we need to make decisions as municipal governments that allow us to get there without being overly restrictive on what we're building. And again, if something isn't working, we can always change it. So let's break some stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Let's break some stuff. <laughs> Mayor Bianca, how does Bel Air handle ADUs? We try not to break stuff. That's what we do <laughs> now. Um, in Bel Air, we've always allowed what's called a cottage house, which sounds so nice and so British. But really, we changed the, um, the code just recently to reflect that as ADUs. And moving forward, this is one of our development regulations we're probably going to go through in September, October. We're going to go through a whole slew of development regulations and see what we need to change. And this is one of the ones that we're probably going to change because right now we only allow close family to utilize an ADU, which is fine. I think to Mayor McGrady's point, we, we do see a lot of family members, especially in Bel Air, we do have a slightly older population than the rest of the county. So it works for right now, but thinking down the road, that may not always work. So we want to make sure we, the language actually reflects where we need to be. What's the point in having this in the code if you make it too restrictive that nobody can ever utilize it effectively? Um, but we also have heard some feedback from members of the community where, to the NIMBY point, you know, well, if you change it too much, it's going to be an Airbnb, there's going to be renters, they're going to be riding, scooting all around scooting. town, breaking stuff, you know, all kinds of stuff. So we're trying to find that balance that still honors what our neighborhoods are looking for, but making sure we can still have people other than close family members utilize these ADUs. Thank you. Mayor Martin, how does your municipality handle ADUs? Um, in the city of Aberdeen Grace, if you're looking for ADUs in our uh, zoning, you'd look up cottage dwellings, not cottage okay. houses. Okay. Anyway. Sounds nice. <laughs> I know. It sound, doesn't cottage sound nice? I mean, I, 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 I picture something it. with planters on the yeah. windows and all that yeah. stuff. Anyway. So we allow them in Aberdeen Grace. Um, 
Uh, not a problem. There's some areas where they're permitted, some uh, uh, permitted use, some conditional use if you want to go to the Board of Appeals. Um, my only thing is, uh, you know, and we, this is becoming more and more uh, the thing now with, uh, with the Airbnbs now being, becoming big and a lot of people are redoing like, you know, an extra room on their house or maybe something above their garages. When you get your building permit and uh, if you exceed 30 fixture counts of, of whatever, sinks, bathrooms, stuff like that, if you exceed 30 fixture counts in your home, you have to pay another uh, capital cost recovery hookup to the city. And that's an issue. That's eighteen thousand five hundred dollars. We're the most expensive in Hartford County. It's a whole other story. Don't worry about it. But I mean, the point is, um, so we've been, we've been, we've had some citizens invest a lot of money in their homes and add on a whole new. But but let me explain. Like the average home is like fifteen fixture counts. I mean, you really need to exceed to get above thirty. And when you're putting in a hot water heater, uh, a wa clothes washer, a dishwasher, sinks, all that, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna hit this. That's that's what we call a whole new home. <laughs> so the only reason the city of Havre de Grace has to do that is that if we're aware that you're exceeding those fixture counts, that takes away capacity from our plant, that takes away capacity for new construction. And so again, there's probably a lot of people that we don't, we're unaware of that have it, but when you, when you do it properly and you get permits and, you know, you can do your in-law suite or you can do your cottage or dwelling and if you're under those 30 fixture counts, we think that's great. City of Havre de Grace respects property rights. You know, do what you want on your property. We really try to be as least restrictive as we can in the most areas of town where it makes sense. But again, uh, that's my only caution: is uh, we're getting we're getting a lot of uh, you know uh, people coming into city hall saying, "Explain to me how my cottage is a burden on the system." I'm like, well, you know, maybe or maybe not. But the point is, that's the law, and we follow Hartford County um, rule on that with the 30 fixture counts. Uh, what is a fixture and things like? There's a whole formula to pipe size and things like that. But hey, that, that's just it. I mean, like I say, uh, you know, most homes you can add in a rough in, you know, you can, you can complete a basement in your home or whatever. You're not even gonna come close to exceeding 30 picture counts. But, but when you're adding on a dwelling unit, you, sometimes you do. Thank you. President Vincente, what are the chances of seeing legislation in the near future to address this at the county level? So, um, you all recall the amount of effort that Councilman Schroeds put forward uh, throughout uh, the whole cycle of trying to get the ADUs passed and get the administration's buy-in. And eventually he was successful in doing that. And then recently uh, he worked on um, 22014, which was allowed uh, the homeowner to expand the size of the outside dweller or building, if you want, um, not to exceed 50% of their home, but to utilize some of the um, other space that they were saying was habitable, if you will. If you have a basement that's not finished, now you can use that space uh, to count toward the size of the building that you'd like to build outside. So we, we've paid attention to that quite a bit. We've listened to your concerns and your input throughout that whole process. Um, and I would think that the next council would be amenable to uh, look at that ADU as well and, and expand it other than just family members. But I will tell you on a personal note, um, it was very near and dear to me because for 16 years I was allowed to move my mother up with us and, and I think fully extended her life by doing that. So um, I, think it's, I think it's something that should be available for whoever has the opportunity and the right zoning to do it. So that's my thoughts. Thank you. You're welcome. Before you go on. Sure. so. It's not all roses. Okay, so another part of my business is residential real estate rentals. Okay, so I've got 150 rental units all in Aberdeen, all in town limits of Aberdeen, except for the ones that are adjacent to my parents' farm, but they're all otherwise all in Aberdeen. And what I have learned through that business is that if there are property owners who don't care about the community, they can do a lot of damage by renting to people who are bad elements, by not doing good rental verification checks. It can lead to a destructive element in your community. Um, this is something you would not have heard me say five years ago, but I have, in, in looking at the way other individuals do business, um, there is a requirement, there, there should be a, a regulatory regime associated with the, with the rental of units such that 
the people who live adjacent to these don't end up getting burned by these dangerous elements that, not dangerous per se, but these, these people who are less than desirable in the community. People, uh, when a landlord uh, acquires, we saw this during the last financial crisis, um, stuff went on sale after that, and a lot of people bought stuff and then were just collecting rent payments without fixing stuff, were renting to anybody who walked in the door, regardless of their criminal background or their rental history, uh, I very rigorously do a rental verification, a criminal background check, and a, and a credit check on everybody I'll rent to, and it hurts my heart to say no to people because there's a lot of families who are in a situation, but I have found that the best way to get burned for the whole community that I manage, for I own, is by renting to people who are, who are toxic. And so there is a, a, a real estate component to good real estate property management that we all need to do when we're thinking about ADU changes. So if somebody's going to build an ADU, we should think about how we can communicate to them, look, here's a good way to manage this if you're going to rent it to somebody who's not your aunt. You can call your aunt and say, hey, cut the grass. But if it's, if it's not your aunt who's living in the ADU behind you, there's challenges that come with that. And there will be a learning curve. Um, but I think it's a net positive, but there is a, a learning curve that goes along with that. Thank you for the opportunity to... Amplify. Thank you. <laughs> the next question for everyone is what are the top three areas where your tax dollars are spent? Mayor Bianca, let's start with you. Oh boy. Coming back over. Thank you, sir. So for the town of Bel Air, we spend just about 68, 70 percent of our budget on salaries and benefits for our workers. Um, we really try and take care of our own because they do such great work in our town. The majority of that goes to the Bel Air Police Department and our DPW, who if you've ever heard, talked to anybody live in town, I don't know if any of you all live in town, but um, they sing the praises of our DPW. That is the most number one thing we get compliments about. It's not just trash pickup, it's recycling, it is uh, yard waste pickup. We, we, you, you cut down a tree, you put it on the curb, we come grind it up, it's cool, the kids love watching, it's fantastic in the fall. You got all the trees, you just push the leaves out to the curb, they come around with a big vacuum truck, they suck it up, make fertilizer out of it. It's just fantastic. Uh, the community really loves it. Uh, bulk pickup, you know, bi bi weekly, bi monthly, twice a month, whatever that is. Um, they come by and you put out anything on the curb, you know, you got your cleaning out your closet, you got bookshelves, couches, put it out there, they come by, pick it up. Are you cold? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, um, and we also have our Bel Air Police Department. We have 32 sworn officers along with some dispatchers and uh, uh, civilian staff, and they do such fantastic work. They're out there in the community every day. They really try and know the faces in the community they police. We're big believers in community policing. Um, we had an incident a couple weeks ago where something happened at the courthouse, and they sent it to Bel Air, and just based on the type of dog that was in the picture, they, oh, we know who that was, and they, you know, they, they were able to just talk to the person within a day, so it's, it's fantastic, um, but that's the majority of our budget. We do have some capital projects coming up that we're building a new town hall police station, which is about 20 years overdue, but we finally got it off the list here. Um, and that'll be a big expense moving forward, but um, we're excited, and certainly the federal ARPA money, uh, the American Rescue Plan Act, has been a big help in realizing that dream for us. So we're excited to keep moving forward. Thank you. Who wants it next? Mayor Martin, what are the tax, where are your tax dollars spent in Haverty Grace? Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, Amy. I can imagine you're going to hear a lot of the same answers here. Um, you know, payroll, you know, paving is a big part of my budget. Uh, City of Haverty Grace, um, operates on an average of a $15 million budget. Like, you know, we just approved a $28 million budget, but there, there was a lot of, um, you know, uh, bond, yeah, one bond money that we were drawn from, from a $15 million bond that was approved two years ago by the citizens. Uh, the ARPA money was $13 million. So, I mean, the budget looks big, but what it actually is, but the, the tax revenues and the average operating budget for our city is around $15 million. So, um, you know. Police can take up six million in that budget, DPW and all that other stuff. So I mean, the DPW is like another five million in that budget. So it eats up really quick. So when you put in like eight hundred thousand dollars for paving, that doesn't seem like much, especially when you compare it to like Carver County and things like that. But you know, on the on our regular budget, we had that that eats it all up. You know, of course, trash. So again, you're going to hear a lot of the same answers just from the municipal mayors here, because that's really what our job is. Uh, you know, we. Make sure your roads are good to drive on. We make sure that the trash gets picked up when you put it out. We make sure that you know a police officer shows up if you're, you know, in need of assistance. You know, ambulance, fire. I mean, those are the top things. But of course, with any organization, it's always your manpower. 
Thank you. Mayor McGrady, where do tax dollars go in Aberdeen? So, yeah, uh, Aberdeen has 44 sworn police officers, uh, total cost of $5,500,000, including pension obligations, a total of 170 employees in the city of Aberdeen. Um, we spend the, so how do we spend tax dollars? The other side of the coin is where does the money come from? The city of Aberdeen gets about, uh, the majority of our money comes from real estate property taxes. So everybody knows here, but real estate taxes are assessed uh, on the assessed value that the State Department of Assessments and Taxation comes up with every three years or based on recent sales. Uh, then we get a tax rate based on that, that is in addition to the county's tax rate. So the county has a tax rate of something like $1 per $100 of assessed value. Today, the city of Aberdeen's uh, is 62 and a half cents per $100 of assessed value. We just passed a budget recently that'll go into effect July 1st. Uh, so what do you get for that? I guess is the tenor of the question. You're getting the Aberdeen Police Department. And so with the Aberdeen Police Department, we have four officers on shift 24 hours a day um, in our confined limits of the city of Aberdeen. So we get, I don't know, it's like five times more policing than you get as a density related to the county. So in the county, you might have a 12 minute or 17 minute response time for a deputy at 117 miles an hour to fly up 136 to your house. In Aberdeen, you call, there's a cop there in two and a half minutes because of the, the proximity and, and those kinds of things. Um, we have not paid for by taxes, but paid for by water and sewer rates that are billed to our 4,500 water and sewer accounts. We have five, four, going to be five water tanks that sit above ground to allow for water flow and water pressure into our system. We've got a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, we provide water and sewer service on Aberdeen Proving Ground. So Aberdeen Proving Ground is a federal institution controlled by the Department of Defense. Aberdeen has a privatization, which fancy word for saying they contract with us to take care of their water and sewer system. Uh, that's part of the stuff that you get in the city of Aberdeen that kicks back about $750,000 a year in profit that goes into the Aberdeen General Fund, which is cost plus 25% is the way that contract works. Um, we've got a bunch of parks and playgrounds. Um, but generally, yeah, all of our costs are people related. And so, yeah, good, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And President Mincenzi, what are the top three places tax dollars are spent in Hartford County? So the administration and its budget department put together another historic level uh, budget for Hartford County, $1.2 billion, of which nearly a half a billion went to education in Hartford County. Uh, 160 million to public safety, uh, which is the Sheriff's Office, um, EMS Foundation, uh, EOC, uh, and others, uh, local fire departments. Uh, and then also 43 million to the administration itself for its operations, and 43 million to DPW. They were tied in third. So those are the top three places. Uh, but when you think of a half a billion dollars, uh, nearly 50 cents on every dollar goes to education in Hartford County. And I think uh, that includes their capital projects, which is about $260 million in the budget. So um, we are uh, obviously finished up Harvard Grace High School, Middle School combination. That was like $108 million. Uh, we're getting ready to uh, move forward with Homestead Wakefield once they figure out the hurdles there, get over those. Uh, we're finishing up Joppa Town's renovations, which was about $35 million. Um, we're looking at the possibility of a new school at Campus Hills uh, to try to relieve some of the overcrowding in the elementary schools. Um, and I have no idea what that cost is going to be. They're still in the planning stages for that. That will also have a component from John Archer. It will move from where it's at and be combined into the new Campus Hills school. Um, so that's a new federal requirement, I understand, that's coming down uh, to incorporate those students in with the general population of the school. Um, so when you hear those numbers, it's, it's just mind-boggling. It really is. But, and again, all of our, the majority of our revenue comes from either income tax or property tax. And one of the things that I think that this administration has done consistently is they've been very conservative with their dollars. Um, this budget not only funds uh, the main things that I talked about, 
but it also funds different things in some of the uh, municipalities. I think Habit of Grace received, like uh, Mayor Martin talked about, a million and a half for the Living Shoreline, I think a half a million or 750,000 for the gymnasium roof. Am I right? Yeah. And, and then about a million seven goes to tourism, which a large portion goes to Habit of Grace because of its nonprofits. And there's other things in that, that budget as well. Um, but again, I think they've done a great job in being conservative with the funds that we receive. And I have to give them credit over the last few years because I think with the Aberdeen Proving Ground being in Harford County and the employees that we have there, it strengthened us and allowed us to weather COVID a lot better than other jurisdictions. And yes, we received ARPA funds too, I think to the tune of about $100 million. Uh, and a lot of that money is being used for one-time projects like broadband. I think it's like 30 or $40 million gonna actually be spent on broadband over the next three years. Um, so I hope that that answers your question. Thank you very much. Yep. All right, Mayor McGrady, can you talk about the city's skate park plans? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> In the year 2000, back when I was a student at Aberdeen High School, the uh, skateboard kids held a series of uh, fundraisers at the old what we call North Building of Aberdeen High School uh, fundraisers to try to raise a little bit of money to build a skate park uh, at that same time the city government long before I understood what city government was uh, uh, acquired a piece of land we call it North Dean Park uh, near the intersection of Post Road and 22. So driving towards Aberdeen Proving Grounds, the last stop light before you get onto the installation is Post Road. If you turn left there and then left immediately again, that's the North Dean community. Uh, back in North Dean, with the help of these skateboarders, they spent $100,000 or so to build an asphalt skateboard park with steel ramps, with a company called American Ramp Company. Um, not being a skateboarder myself, I did not realize until very recently the problems with this, but asphalt, bituminous asphalt is a tar and aggregate solution that is not as hard as you might think. You're driving on your car, you feel like it's hard, but it's soft. And so the impact of that over time is when you're skateboarding, you come down the ramp and then you hit the little lip at the bottom of the ramp and then you go flying off of your skateboard. <laughs> and this is problematic when you're traveling at high rates of speed on a skateboard. Um, <laughs> Through talking to skateboarders, through seeing the degradation over the last 20 years of the skateboard park, uh, we said we need to do something with this. We need to either eliminate it or come up with a way to revitalize this in the North Dean Park. Another program that nobody knows about is called the Community Development Block Grant, CDBG. That when I say it quickly sounds like CDBG, right? But Community Development Block Grant grant is a federal money program where federal government dollars that they steal from us via income taxes and all the other ways by which they get money go to the federal government and then they dole them out politically based on low and moderate incomes across the United States. Uh, these pass through from the federal government to the county government. The county government then allocates them to the towns and cities where you have a low and moderate income. Aberdeen is fortunate to have a high proportion of low and moderate income. And so every year we get a bunch of this money allocated to the city of Aberdeen. Uh, and so uh, in the last 90 days or so, we approved a, an appropriation of $593,000 for the construction of this CDBG money uh, that stacked up for like three or four years because we didn't spend it so we've got a pool of money, it doesn't go away unless you like sit on it for like 10 years. But uh, so we're building a concrete skate park, concrete skate park. So concrete bowls, uh, concrete half pipes, uh, grind rails, it's gonna be awesome. There is nothing like this um, My in- My elbows and knees are hurting. Just <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is nothing like this on this side of the Chesapeake Bay, uh, except for down in Baltimore City. So people are gonna come from all over to this Aberdeen skate park. Uh, I think to be able to skateboard uh, scooters, uh, they do the, I don't know what you call these, the razor scooter type things. So not just skateboards, so and bicyclists. bird scooters? <laughs> the bird scooter only travels 15 miles per hour. And when you're going down the half pipe, when you're going down the half pipe, uh, I think they get faster than that. It w I wouldn't take the bird scooter on the half pipe, but I welcome you to Aberdeen to try it. But the, 
Uh, so this is going to be built by November of this year. Uh, there's a meeting this Wednesday. A professional skateboarder hired by American Ramp Company is going to come and skateboard, uh, skateboard at the park uh, from 4.30 until ooh, 4 until 6. 4 until 5.30. 4 until 5.30. I know this was irrelevant, but if you skateboard, professional skateboarder will be there on this Thursday or this Wednesday from uh, 4.30 to 6. I'm going to go to hang out with him and see what that's like uh, to see that, to talk to our skateboarders in the community there. Uh, as they're putting together their design uh, for the skate park, right? Um, it would not be a good skate park if Council President Vincenti and I designed it. And so we're bringing it, we brought in the professionals to, <laughs> to, to figure out the configuration and the layout. And, uh, and so it's going to be awesome. I'm really excited about what this is going to mean for our skateboarding community. Uh, and so, uh, again, I don't know if this audience skateboards, but it is a thing in the skateboarding community, right, skaters we'll call them, uh, that they use graffiti as a uh, conveyance of their art. So they, they spray paint on their half pipes and on their bowls, uh, pools, right, it's like a swimming pool, uh, so they can, it's, it's really cool. Uh, but part of the conversation is how we're going to handle that. So sometimes graffiti can have messages that you don't want kids to see, um, but it's part of their artistic expression. And so we're uh, talking about potentially building a wall, a uh, block wall that can be used for, this will be where you can put your graffiti, the free speech wall, if you will. So don't graf graffiti on the rest of this because we're going to have to come and clean it off. Uh, and, it'll, and these are self-policing communities. It's, it's really cool, the subculture of skateboarders. Um, anyway, it's very exciting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Mayor Bianca, can you talk about the changes taking place at Bel Air Mall? Absolutely. And what a cool project in Aberdeen, that skate park. I mean, they have a skate park, we have a parking garage with kids go <laughs> flying down 60 miles an hour. Um, I also commend anybody who skates. As somebody who's six foot seven, I'm not doing any sort of balance sports, but. Uh, Harford Mall, certainly uh, I'm sure you all are aware there's undergoing some big changes. There'll be more changes to come. The first step would be a 45,000 square foot retail space with a grocery store that still has not been named yet. I'm sure you're all aware of the uh, rumors going on, but we're under strict orders of secrecy not to disclose. Um, along with some other smaller retail shops that will be there. Now the next phase may or may not be, there's, there's some interested parties and we're not sure where it's gonna land, but it may be an opportunity for a mixed use development where there may be retail on the bottom, um, living spaces on top. It sounds like a great use of that area. Um, so we're excited for the changes. It'll help grow our tax base in Bel Air, which is desperately needed. And we're excited to see what happens. I think it's, it's certainly wasn't the prettiest building there at the end, the Sears and the other stuff. So I think we're excited to re-envision it. There'll be some pedestrian improvements from the areas behind on Gateway Drive. That'll help. Um, it'll help revitalize an area that's in desperate need of um, re-envisioning. So we're excited. Um, I, they're already working on, you know, rebuilding the grocery store area and retail spaces. And hopefully in the next couple months, we'll hear more of an official word as to what the next phase will be. I try to stick in Aberdeen but uh, mm -hmm. I know the Bel Air Auto Auction moved to outside of Aberdeen. What's happened at that site? So that's just outside of town, oh. but right now, um, I think they may have moved back. I've seen a lot of cars there sure. lately. Yeah, it's storage, yeah. I think, and we've tried to kind of work to getting that, but uh, we're not quite there yet. You know, we need Thank to you. annex a few more properties. I can, I can help you with that. <laughs> You're all right. <laughs> Thank you. Mayor Martin. Can you tell us about the possibility of a beaches in Havity Grace? Sure. Um, so I got some good news and got some got some bad news. Good news is we're gonna have beaches in Havity Grace. Bad news is I, I wouldn't let you go swimming there. Um, but you know the reality is, and probably no one knows this better than Council President Vincenti. Um, Havity Grace is a, for hundreds of years it was a working city. Uh, the waterfront was. Um, you know, factories, it was uh, a fishing waterfront, um, duck fouling, just all kind of things. I mean, what's submerged under the water off the shore is dangerous. Uh, we've seen it. Um, you know, a friend of mine just had a really, really nice big boat. He uh, put a hole in the bottom of his boat because submerged right near the dock were cement blocks with hooks and chains on them. Um, you know, only four feet under the water, and there's so much stuff under that water. And I hate to say that. I mean, it sounds threatening, but as long as you don't go swimming, you're fine. I mean, and, uh, you know, even Conquer Point Park, 
was, is built on a landfill where, where the lighthouse yeah. is. So you don't want to go digging there either. You might find helicopters and stuff, right? That's what the old rumor is. So with that said, I mean, again, you're talking about a historic city with a historic working waterfront, submerged pylons, uh, unseen bulkheads, things like that. The good news is, um, with this project I mentioned earlier, this um, shoreline restoration project, there's going to be a wonderful series of several beaches um, going from, again, the lock house down to Tidewater Grill, where the citizens are welcome to walk on. I mean, they're, they're pouring the sand as we speak. Uh, white sand, nice uh, texture to it. People are welcome to sit on it, read a book, put a blanket there, put a chair, walk your dog, play frisbee, launch a kayak. So yes, there are beaches, but not the kind of beaches we would think of like Sandy Point State Park or Ocean City. So, but but that, the good news is, you know, the reality is Havre de Grace, it's a waterfront community, but there really isn't a whole lot of water access sometimes. Right. You know, uh, you know, for some reason, you know, they, they built a water plant right on the water, <laughs> and there's a parking lot there, uh, you know, you know, near Tidewater Grill and, and where the American Legion is, or, um, you know, just, like I say, it's, there's only a few areas where the public can access the water, and we're going to change that. We're going we're to try to uh, make a lot of our town uh, accessible to the waterfront. And uniquely, Haver de Grace owns about half the, wa half the shoreline. I mean, you go to, I grew up in Anne Arundel County, and, you know, good luck on the Seven River or Magazine <laughs> finding a piece of property where it wasn't owned by private residents. Uh, but just because of our, of our history and where the water plant's located and, and where the lighthouse is and where the lock house is, and then we bought, um, you know, five years ago by referendum uh, land from the county, uh, you know, on Water Street, like, we actually own about half the, the shoreline. So our, our goal is to get the people on the water, whether that's, again, fishing, kayaking, boating, just walking on beach, throwing down a blanket, reading a book. So, yeah, like I say, the good news is beaches are coming. Okay. Thank you. President, President Vicente, one word. Compromise. Mm. Mm. As you are aware, the county is anxiously awaiting the development of the Compromise Sports Tourism Complex. Can you give us an update on the, this project and the benefits to the county? I can. Um, Several years ago, well, let me back up a minute. As, as Mayor Martin said, I grew up in Haver de Grace, so I know that shoreline very well. But I also understand the RAF 40 corridor. And uh, Ms. Harris, uh, who came to work for me now five years ago or better, um, grew up in Joppa Town. So she understood that end of the RAF 40 corridor. So about four and a half, five years ago, we started a RAF 40 Revitalization Commission meeting. Uh, most of them been held at Water's Edge. And a lot of things have come out of that meeting that we've had. Obviously, COVID has kind of put a damper on that. And we do have one tentatively scheduled for September, first part of September. Um, but a lot of things have come out of that. And I'd like to think that Copper Mine was one of those things. Uh, we were looking for a catalyst to fire up development and interest in the Edgewood area. Mm -hmm. And uh, Alex Jacobs, who owns Copper Mine, uh, got wind of it, started having a lot of conversations with Mr. Parrish at Economic Development. Uh, they went down, looked at the site, and yes, uh, was able to acquire the, the, the property from the county uh, through a surplus process. And um, COVID has held up them as well as everything else in the country. Um, but they are coming forward, moving forward, have acquired all of their financing. I just spoke to Alex yesterday. Uh, they've acquired all of their financing, their permits, MRA should have all of their permits in hand by August. They're looking for a September uh, shovel in the ground date, September of 2022, with the completion of eight fields in uh, the summer of 23. Um, I asked him specifically because one of the things that we discussed uh, throughout the entire process, surplus process, is what type of access what our local communities and nonprofits have to the fields. So they've made that commitment, they're going to honor that commitment that local communities are going to have several opportunities to host events, uh, have fundraising opportunities there, um, and they're excited, they're looking forward to it. But I think the biggest holdup, as I said before, was COVID. So we're moving forward, looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is for everyone. What are your current or future plans to draw in business, big and small? Let's start with President Vicente. <laughs> I don't know how much involvement I'm going to have, but um, 
as a small business owner, I understand the challenges that we face on a regular basis. Um, and it's all relative. I don't care whether you're um, 160 uh, uh, real estate parcel or 12. Mm -hmm. um, we, we understand each other's challenges and, and every business uh, has the same. So we tried to, my colleagues and I at the County Council have consistently tried to be business friendly wherever we can. Uh, we look for ways to support economic development and try to help them uh, bring different things into play. So if I'm going to stop, Veronica's saying we need to speed up. I oh, oh. <laughs> and I had all this wonderful information. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mayor McGrady, what are your plans to bring in business? <clears throat> Again, uh, I try to break everything down to the most basic level. Uh, I don't like, personally, I don't like the government trying to pick winners and losers. And so rather than saying, what are we doing to try to support business? What I try to look at is how can we make the quality of life such that uh, people want to invest in our community? There's big businesses in Aberdeen. Frito-Lay is there and monstrous investment, monstrous investment. So, oh, oh, so in addition to income taxes, uh, that are paid to the county, that piggyback income taxes uh, paid to the city for the residents who live in the city of Aberdeen and the property taxes. Another thing that unless you own business property you don't realize exists is called a business personal property tax where every year you have to file a personal property tax return with the state of Maryland uh, for every corporation that you control in the state of Maryland that says this is the business real uh, the business personal property that we own tables, chairs, Frito-Lay's uh, example is 140 foot long machines that make sun chips um, and the value, they have to state the value of them, then they have to pay taxes to me, the city of Aberdeen, about 2% of the value of that stuff. So Frito-Lay pays something like $750,000 a year in personal property taxes to the city of Aberdeen. So it is in the interests of getting more money for our local governments to have business investment that has personal property. Other examples of personal property that uh, have afforded the county the ability to spend $500 million a year on government schools is all these warehouses that have been built out the Perry Peninsula and all over the county because the real property, <laughs> the real property of the structure exists, right? And that's taxed as real property, but all the personal property of forklifts and automated stacking equipment and whatever, racking systems and all the fancy equipment they have, they pay 2% of the value of that every year to the state of Maryland that gets put back to the city of Aberdeen and the county, whatever, wherever these things exist. So these things all contribute to the pot of money that we have to spend on the, uh, the things that we desire, the, the local government's desire to spend money on. The question was about business. How are we encouraging business? So I don't think, I don't, you can't. You, it's a race to the bottom to try to create incentives for business to move to your area. Because if you give a grant, uh, if you give a break to a specific enterprise to come to your community, like Perryville did with this Great Wolf Lodge, they gave them a 99.5% property tax reduction for 30 years or some crazy number like this. What happens is, historically, at the end of that property tax reduction, they say, great, thanks, and they find some other sucker municipality to do the same thing for them, okay? Uh, and so what we try to do in Aberdeen anyway, and, and I know that the other jurisdictions are trying to do the same thing, is make it competitive for everybody who wants to do business in our communities to try to improve the quality of life through uh, getting people around, making the community more lovely, so that people want to invest in our communities. And really, it's, it's all that we can do as local governments. Um, it's all that we should do. I mean, we can pick and choose, but that's a dangerous trajectory. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank well you. Done, I was Brian, getting the. <laughs> <laughs> she was going to throw it at me. Mayor B. <laughs> Thank you. Mayor Bianca, what are your plans to bring in business? Well, economic development is always a challenge in the town of Bel Air because we are the county seat and we have a large amount of government, nonprofits, and state entities there that don't pay property taxes. Um, with the recent news, we've heard rumors of it for years of the district court looking to build a new building. Apparently they are moving forward with that. I, uh, we're trying to get answers out of DGS, but you know how that goes with state government sometimes. Um, What's that we, mean? Are they moving? 
there they want to build a new building so they would keep the building on bond street and they want to purchase more property build a new district court building can which, you get them out of bel-air <laughs> we're thinking about it <laughs> um which is it sounds great that you want to keep them in downtown but really that's another chunk of land that would then not pay any taxes so not so good because usually everything is built on in Bel Air. So you're going to take something that's paying taxes and now they're not going to pay any more taxes, which is a terrible idea from my perspective. But uh, DGS going to do what DGS <laughs> going to do. So we'll figure that out. But um, we have just recently, this past budget year, authorized a market study for the town of Bel Air because we're not sure our last one was in 2015. And that kind of clued us in as to what direction we needed to go economic development wise. Um, we were told a few specific things that would be a good fit for our town, and we did get them, one of which was a yoga studio. We now have two yoga studios, uh, something else that I don't remember. But um, we also partnered that with behind our Bel Air Armory. We had the Armory Marketplace, which was surplus by the state for a dollar. I think we overpaid some days. but. Um, <laughs> we turn that into a business incubator space where new businesses come in they pay a very nominal rent to kind of get their feet underneath of them we then transition them to somewhere else in the town of Bel Air so far we have had three graduates um, some of which are doing fantastic the yoga studio studio graduated they're on Bond Street now we have a record store that is doing fantastic right on Main Street um, and then we also had a frame and design, which moved right on the corner of Broadway and Bond. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. They do good work. So we're excited about what comes next. I think we have another opening coming up. Um, one of the businesses in there is transitioning to a different model, more online stuff. So everything's always changing, but it, it's tough in the town of Bel Air. We always try and do what we can because we want to um, make sure we're getting good bang for our buck. But anybody knows anybody at DGS, give me some contact info <laughs> and make some calls. Okay, thank you. And Mayor Martin, what are your current or future plans for to bring in business? Well, <clears throat> thank you. I always say that any five-year-old kid can tell you why boardwalk is the most expensive, that, that boardwalk is the most valuable piece on Monopoly board. But they can't tell you why. But I'm sure a room full of realtors can tell me why. Because that's where people want to be. I was on elected council in 2008, and I served for seven years until 2015 when I was elected mayor. And I know that our economic development department worked really hard trying to, you know, cold call businesses and try to get people to come to the Route 40 area of Haverty Grace just to try to, to bring more amenities to our city. And, and they all, our economic development department was often met with, you know, Haverty Grace is pretty, it's a nice place, we like it, but, you know, the traffic's not there, the people aren't there, so on and so forth. And so when I became mayor, I kind of took a different approach. Instead of like trying to figure out what the businesses want, I said, why don't we just focus on the citizens? Why don't we just focus on people's community, the life? I wanted to make Haverty Grace boardwalk. I want events going on and things to do. I want a walkable community. I want a community that focuses on like outdoor recreation, arts and entertainment. We're an arts and entertainment designated district. And when I became mayor, we had no art. There was no murals. There was no monuments. I mean, now you go to Haverty Grace, there's murals everywhere. And, you know, we have the fish sculpture. We have the Ernest Burke statue. We have so many things going on in Haverty Grace now. When I became mayor, we had no yeah. performing arts centers. Now we have three. We have the Opera House. We have the State Theater. Um, and we have the new Star Center, which is the old high school. So we're trying really hard to make Haverty Grace the place where people want to be. It doesn't take a genius to realize that's where the businesses want to go, where the people are happy and people want to be. And so that's our approach is let's find out what makes the people happy and what makes a good definition of a community and the businesses will come. Thank you. While we're transitioning there, so uh, to your point, Mayor Martin, when you talk to these corporate entities that select sites for the businesses that our people say they want, uh, I don't go to these fancy places, but the names escape me at this moment. People say, we want a blank. I've always got this person on my Facebook page who always says, you know, we need a Long John Silvers. For five years, this person has been, every time I post something, we need a Long John Silvers. And every time I ignore it because I'm like, what? Like, what a weird thing to demand. Like, I don't even know how to respond to that. But, but people say, we need a Wegmans or we need a Kohl's or we need a place to go Trader shopping. Joe's. Trader Joe's, yes. We need this, you know, you know, rich white person amenity that exists in, in this place that I like to go to, right? I mean, and the reason that they post up there is because the, uh, the Wall Street entities that 
do the site selection, not a criticism of this, but the way that the process works is they have a, uh, uh, a data set of the people, uh, the incomes of the households. I don't know if you knew this, but there's 12,000 data points on your household, right? The, what, the kind of things you like, the kind of things you do, the places you shop, the magazine subscriptions, the Netflix things that you watch are all in this data set. And they look at this and they say, how many people who meet our target customer live within this many uh, minutes by car of the location that we're looking at? And, the, and if it doesn't meet the top you know, 50 locations, it gets booted. And so one way to resolve this is by you know, building new stuff such that these people move in your place. But I think the smarter way to do it is what Mayor Martin is describing, is being a community that's lovely to serve your people, and then the good stuff follows. But good, thank you. Sorry, Amy, for the okay. bogarting <laughs> of the transition. <laughs> thank you. All right, Mayor Martin, back to you. Oh, now I did it. Recently, the city of Haverty Grace held a hearing to place a moratorium on short-term rentals. Can you tell us a little bit about the reasons behind this action? Yeah, sure, Amy, no problem. And, and just one second, I forgot to add something in my previous comment when I said about you know focusing on the community and the quality of life and the public safety and the, and the where the people are and they want to be and they're happy, the business will follow. Last year, we finally hit 100% uh, um, no vacancy with our downtown businesses. Uh, so when, in 2015, that wasn't the case. About half our shops downtown were, were empty storefronts. So again, we, that's our approach because of the uniqueness of our community, but it's different other places. But, so to the question of um, uh, public hearing on, on a moratorium for short-term rentals, uh, sure, I mean, probably the, the the word is Airbnb in most cases. It's really becoming very popular in Haverty Grace. And um, the city council just enacted temporary, it was a temporary moratorium. It's still in place. Uh, talking to the council president, uh, Jim Ringsocker, I know that they're probably going to take some action on it uh, sometime this, uh, in July or, or August probably to, to, to lift the moratorium and let it proceed. But um, I can't put words in her mouth. But anyway, the whole reason they're doing it, first of all, Haverty Grace recognizes we don't have a whole lot of hotels in Haverty Grace. Uh, we recognize that, you know, we want people to come and stay. There's a lot of weddings that take place in Haverty Grace at different venues. So, you know, the city of Haverty Grace has nothing at all against Airbnbs or short-term rentals. Uh, I believe the council's reasoning behind the moratorium was just put a, a quick temporary pause on it and just kind of examine the impact. Uh, they want to allow it. They're, they're looking at where to allow it in certain areas. Probably the biggest, the best example I could probably give, um, if you're familiar with Union, I know everybody here is familiar with Union Avenue and Haverty Grace from like the 7-Eleven going all the way down to the one mile down to Titans Park. Now, a long time ago, many, many decades ago, uh, that was all residential. You know, kid playing in the front yards and things like that, and then they changed the zoning to residential RV, resi residential business. And because of the hospital, um, a lot of those houses turned into doctor's offices. And so what you have now is, is a street uh, that will be, you know, doctor's office, doctor's office, doctor's office you know, title company. <laughs> uh, and, and then you have a kid playing in the front yard with no other kids to play with. Then doctor's office, doctor's office, doctor's office. So, I mean, so you don't want to, you know, just by inadvertently have a whole town full of short-term rentals and no, and no community anymore. And so council uh, is looking at, you know, they're trying to get their, their hands around uh, the whole short-term rental issue. Again, I can't put words in the council's mouth because I haven't seen the final legislation yet. I mean, okay. they may allow some areas, not others. They may just say, okay, we paused it. Just go ahead and resume. Have fun. They're just, again, uh, they're taking a look at it and the potential impacts of what it could do to the, to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Bianca, as realtors, we hear from potential homeowners how they would like to move into Bel Air, and we know that Bel Air has maxed out its footprint. In other words, there's no place to grow outwards for more housing. We also understand that as infrastructure ages and services become more expensive, the tax demands will become greater on the current residents. What plans does Bel Air have to address these problems? Well, thank you, Amy. Um, as we talked about earlier, the town of Bel Air, we're about three square miles, and there's really nowhere <coughs> left, bless you, left for us to go. Uh, there's a few limited opportunities for annexation, but really it's the question becomes, what do we do with the land we already have? Now, for years, we've heard from some members of the community that says, well, town of Bel Air, you need to start going up. You need to look at higher density housing, whether that's townhomes, apartments, condos, in the downtown corridor. 
Um, as you may have heard lately, it, that's been a fight in our town. Um, change does not come easily for anyone, especially, bless you again, especially, that's okay, um, especially the town of Bel Air. We have a lot of residents who have put down roots um, and have been there for, you know, many, many years. And I think all across the country, not just in Maryland, not just in Hartford County, you've seen this where home ownership is an investment. And I think people tend to fight anything they view as a threat to that investment, whether it makes sense or doesn't make sense. I also think it's generational differences where uh, I think Mayor McGrady and I are about the same age. And, and I think we're what, older millennials, is that the term? It Elder be millennials, yeah, yeah okay. they anymore. Fair enough, I hear you. Um, but millennials and younger, they want Elder, to live. Elderly millennials. <laughs> That's what it is, yeah. Doesn't sound any better. Um, we want to live in downtown areas that are walkable. We walk to shops, we walk to restaurants, we support our community. We've heard from all the business owners on Main Street, Bond Street, to say, yes, we, we want more downtown residents to support our stores, support our shops. Um, but then you have a different generational viewpoint that says, no, 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 you can build, but just build a single family house. Well, I got to believe in five, 10 years, there's not going to be any more single family homes being built, at least anywhere near we're living in Bel Air. There's just no room. Where would you put them? So I, I think it really, we have to stop and think, you know, are we going to continue to look backwards or we're going to start looking forwards as Bel Air? Because you know, living in a downtown area with walkable living is really the goal for a lot of people. And we're trying to find ways that we can do that while still respecting um, the wishes of our community. Thank you. Mayor McGrady, in January, Aberdeen began the process of updating the 2011 comprehensive plan. The plan includes topics such as land use, transportation, future growth, and public facilities. What substantial changes were made? Good. Thank you for the question. I'm going to politician here a little bit and come back to uh, Mayor Bianca's answer, uh, and then I'm going to come back to the comprehensive plan. The a challenge that every community faces is change, um, and it, there's nothing wrong with not changing. There's nothing wrong with not changing. If that's the direction the community wants to go, um, there have been communities that have embraced change and have built the multi-story residential dwellings. If home ownership is the desired end, though, if home ownership is the desired end and to the point about uh, affordable, attainable housing, for ownership condos can exist. They can exist. A big reason that multifamily rentals are being built en masse instead of for ownership condo rentals, effectively the same structure, is because of the Maryland statutes regarding condominium construction and developer liability for construction defects. Every single residential condo building that is built because of the state law in Maryland at year nine and a half has lawsuits filed by one person in the community claiming construction defects, which holds the builder to account. The statute is a 10-year limitation on construction defects, defects, and the trial lawyers, they go and they find a plaintiff so that they can extract money from the builder of these. This causes... Lawyers would never do that. Yeah, right. So this causes the builders to build for rent multifamily instead of for owner multifamily condos. That is an entry level home. The $250,000, you know, 1,100 square foot condo that's serviced by an elevator that a family can afford as their first home is something that satisfies a lot of the criticisms of people who don't want the rentals, right? Because it's, it's a condo that you can own rather than having to come up with $20 million to build the, the rental building. Anyway, consider that as we're working with our state legislature. Um, I think they can fix a lot of that with reducing that construction defect timeline. Aberdeen, uh, every 10 years, I'll pause so let that sit in and then come back to the comprehensive plan. <laughs> every 10 years in the state of Maryland, a municipality has to adopt a comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan is hundreds of pages of baloney pointing to baloney like, you know, our desire for land use on the boundaries of the municipal entities and, and the construction and transportation networks and all this stuff. The, the crux of it is what does your your governing body, the municipal government, your county council, desire for the next 10 years of changes in your community to look like. 
Um, Aberdeen is still in the process of our comprehensive plan rewrite. You got to pay a consultant to do it again. It's I think the county's last one was 374 pages. I hope our, ours, ours can't possibly be that long, but uh, it looks at where the municipal in Aberdeen, where we can grow, uh, the process by which we expand our municipal boundaries is called annexation. If there's a property that wants to uh, be annexed into the city of Aberdeen to get access to our water and sewer and our great police department or whatever they're trying to do, uh, there's a process by which that goes. All of that is itemized in the 10-year plan that we call the comprehensive plan. Practically speaking, the changes that we're looking at are uh, increasing the size of our transit-oriented development area in our traditional downtown West Bel Air Avenue and Route 40 uh, to include more of the Aberdeen's east side for potential redevelopment in the future uh, and increasing the, like I talked about earlier, the, the street design requirements uh, to make it a more lovely place for people to be, for families to be, to make it a lovely place for people to visit. And I'm very excited about it. But it, it should be finalized here in the next 90 days or so. But more to follow. Good. Thank you. Thank you for both those answers. Um, President I know Mincenti, we're running out of time, and i got to talk quickly. <laughs> <laughs> President Mincenti, recently the council had to take action regarding a project in Perryman. What is the process for commercial property development in the county and in that arena, and do you have any updates on revitalizing the office spaces along the Route 40 corridor? So um, I'm going to walk softly with Perryman because it's ongoing litigation. Uh, the Perryman folks have decided to bring a lawsuit against Harford County Government, um, Chesapeake uh, Development Corporation, uh, Frederick Ward Associates, Mr. Mitchell himself. So um, what, I will, what I will try to <clears throat> bring to light here is that from the beginning, typically I don't attend any community input meetings or any DAC hearings. I purposely stay out of them because we never know what's going to come before us in any type of zoning appeal case. Uh, this was a little different because so many near and dear friends reached out to me in December and asked me to come to the community input meeting, and I went. And there was like 400 and some people there. This might take a few minutes to That's get through. <laughs> there was over 400 people there. And, and I listened to their concerns. And immediately following that meeting, uh, a couple of the residents approached me and asked me to attend a meeting at one of the Perryman residents' home to discuss their wish list of what they would like to see come to light. And I went. And um, a result of that was they delivered to me a list of things that they would like to see with road improvements, buffers, bridges, the whole nine yards. And they had an engineer's help. Uh, one of the residents, Stacy, I can't remember her last name, is an engineer. I'm sorry, Stone. 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 And um, so they brought it to my Churchville office. I met with them. And I then delivered it to uh, the developer's attorney and said, this is what the citizens want to see. This is what you're going to have to do to possibly coexist and their concerns are legitimate. Their traffic concerns, their public safety concerns are legitimate. And um, so as a result of that, the developer came back three weeks later with his uh, plan, and he incorporated $25 million worth of upgrades to their plan to address every concern that the citizens laid in front of them. Um, Ford's Lane, uh, Park Beach Drive, Mitchell Lane, Canning House, uh, all of that with flyovers, uh, new roads, um, set more uh, buffer setback. Um, and then I got out of it, you know. Um, so obviously, is there a process that they have to follow? And they're, they moved through that. They had their uh, DAC hearing. Um, and, you know, as we filed through with it, uh, we considered a moratorium. It was brought to light. It had some flaws. Uh, we approved it. And immediately after we approved it, I asked the council uh, to approve uh, the possibility to retain outside counsel just to check and make sure that we were on legal standing ground. And as a result of that, we, we retained a, a, a firm. 
Uh, they gave us their opinion based on facts, based on case law, and we didn't take it any further. And obviously the county executive um, vetoed our moratorium. So that's basically where we're at up to speed. Uh, I still say today there are road issues. Uh, we looked at access. Um, the mayor's sister uh, called me on the phone and gave me information that I didn't have. And I looked into it uh, with a new access off of Mitchell Lane in Route 40. <coughs> and someone in the meantime had acquired a piece of the ground and gave it to uh, a trust, some sort of a, a land trust which blocked that access. So, um, you know, there's a, been a lot of effort and a lot of time put into this uh, recently uh, in the last, you know, six, seven months. Um, but, you know, you have to go back to the fact that that property had been zoned 30 years ago, residential, changed 20 years ago into light industrial. Um, and I do believe that as a part of this next council's chore or charge, is that they are going to have to look at all the permitted uses, all the zoning code, and update it along with the master plan and comp zoning. Uh, because what was light industrial years ago is, is not the same today. We all know that. Uh, but they are zoned by law to build what they're building, and um, I'm going to leave it alone. Thank you. You're welcome. Mayor Bianca, what is the next big upcoming event in your area? Well, that would be the 4th of July celebration, I would really? imagine. Yeah, it starts at, I don't know, I think there's a flag raising. starts at 6.30 in the morning, uh, 4th of July, but there's all-day events, Shamrock Park, uh, water balloon toss, watermelon eating contest, um, got stuff all day, parades at 6 p.m., so hopefully the weather holds out and it'll be another wonderful 4th of July. You say it's supposed to rain? Is that what you said? Yeah. It's not going to rain. You stop it. You early. stop it. It's, it's not, not going to rain. rain. <laughs> That's right. Knock it off. No rain. Nah, it'll Bianca be Bianca dictated it, so it's not going <laughs> to rain. That's right. <laughs> it shall be so. Thank you. Mayor Martin, what is the next big event taking place in Harvard Grace? Uh, Fort July Parade. <laughs> <laughs> now, we are, yeah, big weekend coming up. This is one of the biggest weekends uh, for the city. So Friday will be first Fridays. Park anywhere and jump on a trolley. Go downtown. <laughs> Um, Saturday will be Spirit of America. We shut down our historic district, and uh, it's just all kind of like, you know, Americana, Uncle Sam stuff, like kids' boxcar races and little kids' bike parades and stuff. It's going to be like, you know, we started that last year. It was kind of a – the Howard Grace Alliance started it, and now we're going to do it again this year. It's a really nice just, – just keeping the theme of independence going for the whole weekend. Of course, Sunday, July 3rd, will be our uh, parade down Union Avenue. Um, starts at 2 o'clock. And then afterwards, uh, in the interim, there's, there'll be um, all kind of festivities going on downtown in our historic area. There's a, there, there's a free concert at Hutchins Park. Um, there's also a free concert down at Conquer Point Park, where the fireworks will be, uh, will be, will be lit off and displayed. But uh, yeah, a lot, lot, of, lot of great stuff going on throughout the summer and, and, and good things. Waterfront Festival coming up at the end of August. Like I say, uh, just, just swing on by. Almost every weekend in the summertime, we got stuff going on. Thank you. That should be a lot of fun. Mayor McGrady, what's the next, next big event taking place in Aberdeen? We don't have any events on the scale or scope of the wonderful festivities in Bel Air and Haverty Grace School, so my family will probably be participating in both of those. <laughs> uh, we have a second Saturday's uh, events at Aberdeen's Festival Park. If you're familiar with Aberdeen, it's near Aberdeen City Hall, uh, down in the historic downtown. Uh, second Saturday is what we're trying this year is farmers markets and then activities for kids and a movie uh, every second Saturday the next one I guess is July second Saturday in July <laughs> and then second Saturday in August uh, I understand that this one in July there's gonna be uh, ice cream for kids are making Sundays and apparently they're gonna get covered in ice cream so that'll be fun and uh, it's welcome to everybody's welcome for that uh, something that we did recently that is not in the category of events that we were very surprised by is uh, two weeks ago we did a uh, community trash bulk pickup so we got 30-yard uh, dumpster cans I know they do something like this in Haverty Grace where we had uh, people anybody who could demonstrate that they live in Haverty Grace could come and bring uh, their trash to our 30-yard cans we had 750 people come and take you know everything from barbecue grills to old bookcases that have been in their garage we filled up 12 30-yard cans of trash 
between 7 a.m. and noon. The hours were 7 to noon. People were lined up at 5.30 in the morning with their trash stuff. Wow. Um, I had no idea. So, uh, again, I do residential, single-family, multifamily. If I need to get rid of stuff, I'm getting rid of stuff, right? I've got 30-yard containers. I've got 8-yard dumpsters all over the place. I didn't realize that normal people don't do that, right? And so I guess normal people just keep stuff until they have an opportunity to take it somewhere. Um, Anyway, so that was something that was novel. It's not exciting. It's not as great as a parade, but it's something that we're going to replicate again because of how, uh, how positive feedback we got. People waited in line two cars deep for like an hour to put their barbecue grill. Like, it doesn't make any sense to me, but it was very exciting and it was a productive thing. Thank you. Trash removal. Would be Thank exciting. you. Yes. Well, the last question of the day is what county, city, or town resource would you like to share with everyone today, like a town or city website or Facebook page? We'll start with President Vincenti. I mean, obviously, obviously um, <clears throat> I would go to uh, the county website if you have any questions at all, but also uh, visit the county council website uh, as well. Uh, and then Ms. Harris produces a newsletter from us with all of the uh, council highlights, if you will, if there's any. Um, but uh, that, that's what I would suggest. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Now, Mayor McGrady, do you have any resources to share? Sure. Of course, the uh, City of Aberdeen website is at aberdeenmd.gov. Uh, what I like to pitch to folks who invest in real estate and deal in real estate is the value proposition in Aberdeen. The same house that you can get in Bel Air for $750,000, you can get in Aberdeen for $375,000. Uh, and it's a value parade though. We don't have a parade. Uh, but there's a value proposition in, in residential and commercial real estate. That's why I have chosen Aberdeen as my home. It's why I invest in Aberdeen. It's because it, we really have the opportunity to do big things. And so if, if people, if value is something people are interested in, uh, they should look twice at Aberdeen. Thank you. On to Mayor Bianca. Skate park come yeah, up. Yeah. Bird scooters. Yeah, bird scooters. <laughs> nah, Havit and Grace and Aberdeen both do great jobs. Uh, you know, my family, we got a five year old and a two year old, we're out there playing in Havit and Grace playgrounds all the time, hanging out in Aberdeen. We, we love it. They do great jobs. Um, you can always visit uh, ballermd.org. Uh, a great website for us would be the Downtown Alliance website. They'll have a lot of events, First Fridays, Barbecue Bash, uh, the Bel Air Market, which had, takes place on Sundays. A lot of resources there that tells you what's going on. They keep a calendar of all the events in town. So check out the, I think it's downtownalliance.org maybe. Uh, you can Google it, it'll pop up, and they have a great schedule there. Thank you. And to wrap it all up for us, Mayor Martin, are there any resources you'd like to share for Harvard Grace? Yes, uh, the standard website for the city, uh, have, have it um, It's We've invested a lot of money in, in the last couple of years in our, in our website profile. Um, you can find out some things that are happening in town. Also, you can pay your water bill, your property tax bill online through that site. We do have social media presence. So the city has a Facebook page that tells you of anything you might need to know if there's a, um, a, a change in a weekly pickup of trash or recyclables or if there's any projects going on or street closures because water repairs or anything you might need to need, uh, know about. So that's a good place to go to. That's on the website as well. We also have a Facebook page for tourism, uh, explore Havre de Grace. But also I want to let citizens know and anybody that might be watching this uh, film, like one of the things we use our website for is to really show people, try to show people where their tax dollars are going. So a few years ago in February of 2020, we, uh, there was a special election for a public referendum to approve a 15 million dollar bond bill for water and sewer infrastructure. So if you go to the city website, havertograceMD.com, and you go under DPW, we have an interactive, the DPW icon, Department of Public Works, we have an interactive map of streets with little flags on them. You click on the flag, it'll show you um, what's going to be uh, fixed there, or if it has been fixed or will be fixed. There's pictures of the project. So you can literally see where your, your tax dollars are going when we told the citizens we need to fix the roads and our, you know, we need to fix the sewer, water and sewer lines. So it's kind of cool. We really take pride on that. So every, every week it's updated. So people say, oh, I'm glad they're replacing that water line from 1820, whatever. But so, so those are good, good resources. I just uh, let the citizens know that they're probably unaware of. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, with that, we're at the end of today's program. My fellow moderator, Azalea Johnson Fox, and I would like to thank Harford County Council President Pat Vincenti, Mayor of Aberdeen, Patrick McGrady, Mayor of Bel Air, Kevin Bianca, and Mayor of Havre de Grace, Bill Martin, for taking time out of their busy schedules today to be here with us. I'd also, like to thank, I'd also like to thank the members of the State of the Municipalities Task Force, especially Veronica Rolicott, our Government Affairs Director, 
for all their hard work and for all of you audience to being a part of our special and informative event. I wish everyone a safe and healthy summer. Thank you.